We have another question here from the Stanford group. It's Mr. LaRouche, as you know, we have labored over the distinction between a monetarist system and a credit system, both from the standpoint of historic function and from the standpoint of an urgently required restructuring. Utilizing your triple curve function, it became apparent to us that what had been a decades-long process of economic disintegration reached a new and more dramatic phase in approximately the middle of 2007 when the price of monetary aggregates as opposed to regular financial aggregates began to skyrocket. At the same time, net physical income uh, for physical consumption began to spiral downward. The result was a collapse in the market for products, especially for products of production. And as that occurred, employment also began to move in a rapidly accelerating downward spiral. But the volume of monetary aggregates soared, contrary to financial transactions related to the real economy. This process grew even more critical with the effort to prop up and sustain these monetary aggregates at the expense of America's physical economy. The Obama administration, contrary to its promises, has adopted policies that have not only continued this, but actually have accelerated the process. And it's our conclusion that this series of facts is absolutely indisputable scientifically, and we're prepared to defend it. Now, in terms of a transition to a credit system, when you discuss a return to a Glass-Steagall framework and putting the current system through bankruptcy reorganization, it seems very apparent to us that what you are discussing and what former Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker is discussing are two very different things. <laughs> Our question to you is, aren't you really talking about eliminating the monetary curve entirely? It would seem that then the primary measure of economic value becomes the interaction between the financial curve and the curve which represents the physical economy. And that that is the basis of what you refer to as a credit system. Are we correct in, in concluding this? Uh, and if not, could you please shed more light on where we're making a mistake? OK, got you. Well, no, th there is a little discrepancy here. The discrepancy is simply this. I do not believe in monetary value. I believe in a, in a uh, assigned monetary assessment of value. But that, that is not mathematically interchangeable as, as uh, that value is physical. Monetary value is not physical. It's a conventional value, not an actual value. The actual value, you see, you have to go back to the question of what is an economy. Money has nothing to do with the real economy as such. Hmm? That is, in terms of the essential ter value terms, money has nothing to do with real value. Money is a convention. It's a piece of workable fakery in terms of like promissory notes. And the promises are what they are, and the outcomes are not necessarily in accord with the promises. The value here lies in the rate. Let me, oh, this is a, I've referred to this before. Let me do it this way. What's involved here is, first of all, the increase of the productive powers of labor as measured in the level of population, of density, and pro productive powers of labor of the population as a whole. That's value. 
This value is determined by a rate of growth, which is not necessarily a simple increase, but it's an increase in productive powers of labor. Uh, it's increase in productivity. That the idea of profit itself, as real profit as opposed to nominal profit, is located, is there an increase in the physical productive powers of labor as measured per capita and per square kilometer? That's your fundamental measure. That's your measure of value. And it's a measure of value of development, not of a fixed value. There's no such thing as a fixed value of, of money. It does not have fixed value. If money sits there and is not invested, it deteriorates. If, it's, if somehow if the process is, becomes more productive, it suddenly appreciates. It has no intrinsic value. It's a convention we use in society in order to organize trade, or to organize trade and investment. That's all. Nothing wrong with that. But we have to keep it in its place. Don't make it a god. Huh? And the monetary ideas are the ideas are, are the typical poison. Huh? So therefore, what we're talking about is the increase in the productive powers of labor. You've got two problems here. You have, let's take the planet, the biosphere, which includes the lithosphere. We're on this planet Earth. Huh? Now, are we increasing the potential population density for human beings of the, on the planet Earth, or are we not? That's number one, estimate of value. Are we increasing the potential population density of this planet, of human beings? Are we? Or are we not? Value. What's that got to do with money? Nothing. Are we, are we increasing man's power to increase this gain? Ah, now we're touching upon money. Came up early, we were discussing this thing about the China investment, the trillion dollar investment. If we take a trillion dollars of Chinese claims against the US dollar, and if I sits there, it has one value, which is pretty much that of dung. <laughs> if I say this same $1 million of credit, $1 trillion of credit, is going to be invested in a science driver program to transform the productive powers of labor throughout much of Asia, well, and you're getting a lot of growth of value. Ah, then that trillion dollars worth something, isn't it? So value is based on these kinds of considerations. There is no such thing as an intrinsic monetary valuation, except among people who believe in the fairies or something. So that's the difference. So we, as we do with the triple curve, what we're looking at, we're looking at a physical relationship to a monetary process. We're looking at one case, we're looking at it from the standpoint of the money system. Another case, we're looking at it from the standpoint of a credit system, a financial credit system. And we're looking at it, thirdly, from the standpoint of a physical system. So therefore, the, the success of the process means that the physical system is increasing in terms of man's power to exist in the universe. That's the, that's the physical part. Second, the monetary part is simply fictitious. It's imperialism. Then you have in between the credit system, which is the credit uttered for the purposes of promoting actual productive activity and sales and so forth of real goods, which are invested either as consumption to support people, which is good, or as investment to increase the productive powers of labor as such. So therefore, the real values are these relations, which are essentially physical, mental relations. They're physical in the sense mankind is physical. They're mental in the sense that they deal with the creative powers of the human mind and the development of the creative powers of the human mind. Those are the real values. And the function of government, if it's sane government, is to regulate finance, economy, 
government according to these understandings. Their objective is to increase the productive powers of labor through developing the mental powers of mankind and improving their health, of course, at the same time. And everything else is simply, is simply a, things we take into account in managing the productive process. But money is not the productive process. Money is a convention which we use, uh, presumably, under policies which govern the way we use money. And it's the policies that contain the value and the expression of those policies, not a value as such. And so if you just stick with the, uh, with the triple curve and realize it by eliminating the monetary curve, which is the imperialist curve, and going to only a credit system, which is what is in the U.S. Constitution, the U.S. Constitution pres proscribes a monetary system and prescribes a credit system. And that's explicit. It's explicit under Hamilton's initial efforts, and it's explicit in the Constitution. We have been corrupted by the intervention of the British system, which is a monetary system, an intrinsically imperialist system of at least 3,000 years in, in existence. So that's the distinction. So what we need to do is simply reorg. What we do is, for example, if we cancel this several trillion, $20 trillion or so of monetarist debt, oh, gone, get thee gone, devil. <laughs> if we do that, what happens? We say, ah, ah. And then we say, ah, but we now can create a number of tens of trillions of dollars of credit, which is no longer this monetarist crap. We are now going to assign credit to rebuild our industries, for rebuilding our infrastructure, for developing our healthcare system, and so forth. And this will produce real physical value. And therefore, the end result is the real physical value. And the end result of physical value is determined how many people we have, do we have, how, what is their life expectancy, how long is it, huh? what's their health, health condition, what's their productivity, what's their education, what's the rate of improvement of life among the, our population in general. These are the, the real issues that we deal with. How creative are we? How smart, how creative are our people? How, how many inventions have they made? How many things have they done that are brilliant? That, those are the real values. And we have to simply take the process of government and use the instruments of management of government and self-management of government to bring about these results. What we really are talking about is increasing the productive powers of labor, which is another way of talking about of increasing man's power as man. What we're talking about is immortality. We're talking about a process in which mankind is a creative species, the only willfully creative species on this planet or any other planet we know of. And we're defending the essential immortality of man, or what should be the immortality of man. We, as animals, we're born and we die. We have animal bodies, they're born, and they die. We try to make that as comfortable as possible and as happy and as long as possible. But that's not what man is. Some people call it the soul. But you look at the factor of creativity in human existence and culture. You realize there, that when a person makes a creative contribution to society as a human individual, it doesn't end there or begin there. What happens is, is that in the process of humanity as a whole is generating creative products of the mind. Culture is being developed. The powers of mankind are being increased. This has no beginning that we know of. This is humanity. This is culture. This has no end that we know of. As long as there's progress, it goes on indefinitely. And as we may come and go, be born and die, we are a participant in a process 
which we can call creativity. And creativity was there before we were born and will be there after we die. And we have, in a sense, immortality in time by virtue of participating in this phenomenon called creativity. And that's what the moral purpose is. And the moral purpose should dictate gov government. We want to produce people who are more powerful in terms of their development, who are maintaining the heritage of people before them, the great ideas, so that when people die, what they have done does not die. It's embodied in what happens to society later. And what came before them never did not die either because it is embodied in them. And you have a sense of a human interest as being the interest of mankind, who in one side is merely a mortal creature like an animal who comes born and dies. But the role of mankind in this process is not that of an animal. The role is a process of creativity from earlier generations to the future. So you live not as an animal, you live as a creative part of humanity. Who you live eternally in what, came, what you came out of. You live eternally in what comes out of you. You are really mankind. And you are mankind by being a creative process, by being a creative part of this process which is specific to mankind as not to any form of beast. To be man, not beast. To be a participant in that great force of creativity which is unique to humanity, which began before you were born and lives on as creativity after you die. And you have a permanent place in space-time, in physical space-time, in that creativity. That's what you have to think about. <laughs>